This is an interview that I did with the great Lou Bradley. He was the head engineer at the Quonset Hut, and he recorded some of the greatest records in the history of country music. We recorded this interview at the Quonset Hut on Music Row, and he explained how they used to do it back in the day, old school album recording. As an example, he used Charlie Rich's classic album, Behind Closed Doors. I met Charlie Rich uh, on session here. That's where I first met Charlie Rich. I started, I, I went to work for Columbia in 1969, June of 69, middle of June. And uh, almost immediately started doing Billy Sherrill records. And so uh, he was recording Charlie Rich. So I started working with Charlie Rich and Billy. And uh, that was uh, where I first met him. Of course, I was like everybody else, a fan. Well, he started out, he was on Sam Phillips label. He had uh, lonely weekends and sitting and thinking and stuff. And then he was on RCA. And Chet had signed him to R the whole industry. He was like Willie. The whole industry loved him, but the public didn't. And I, I believe this about Charlie Rich. Charlie Rich had more sex appeal. We can talk about this later than any man I was ever around. He could walk in a room and you could literally hear the panties blow out. I don't know if you can use that, but <laughs> that's the truth. When he sang to the ladies, he had big hits, and and the record just before. He liked to do blues and jazz and stuff like that. That's what he liked to do. But when he sang a song to the ladies, like a love song, oh, they loved it. And uh, the record just before Behind Closed Doors, the same guy that wrote Behind Closed Doors, Kenny O'Dell, I back it on up and take it on home, was the record we did just before that. And, and that, that did, you know, that did pretty good for him. But it was not the blockbuster that... Uh, behind closed doors was. You know, they have a few days of, up in Billy's office probably, you know, before we record. And uh, Had yeah. you heard the song before? No, nope. I never recorded? heard the song until we recorded it. I think the piano is just amazing on that whole album. It just well, that's Pig Robbins playing the piano. And the interesting thing about that, I showed you how we, out in the studio there, how we uh, set up. We had a spot down near the control room where the singer would normally stand. It worked really good there in the background singers. Billy felt that Charlie would be more comfortable standing right by the piano. He could almost touch Pig on his shoulder. That's a, you know, right down the middle of the band. The drums are on the other side of the piano from him. He said, I believe he'll be more comfortable there. Well, we started cutting these big hits and we cut everybody that way. I had to, and when I moved Charlie down there, they moved the background singers down there too. So they're standing right there where they can hear him and see him, and uh, it, they're all down there in a big wad. <laughs> but it, it worked. The intro to Behind Closed Doors, yeah. did Pig Robbins come up with mm -hmm. that? As far as I know, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Pig came up with that. And uh, Was everybody welcome to just pitch in ideas for a song like that? Well, oh, yeah. Uh, what, th what happened in this room right here, in this town, was a way to make records. You could walk in that back door out of that alley with an idea, and three hours later, you could walk out here with three hits. There you, when I first started here in 69, there was a, what I called a little magic time period when they'd start, they'd, somebody would sing the song, the writer or the artist, if he, if he wrote it or whatever, or we had a demo to play, we'd play it. They'd write them a chord chart, start working up the arrangement. And it, that would be back a, a little, about a 10 minute period of experimentation. And uh, a lot of magic happened in that time. Somebody would hear something that nobody else heard and they'd gravitate to that. It might be something way the drummer heard it or the piano player or one of the guitar players and, uh, or the bass player in, in a way to approach the chord progression or whatever. And they all were getting familiar with the song. It could have been on the demo, something similar to that. Or Charlie, but sometimes Charlie would sit down and fool with it, and, and Pig uh, would pay attention to what he was doing, or, or Billy Sherrill could have come up with that. I don't know. Uh, I just know that's what they came up with, and uh, it worked. <laughs> it's one of the all-time great intros oh, yeah. to the song. Well, we cut that, and the record was shipped to New York. They and our people up there in the middle, you know, breaks. You got that break, and and the Kerrigan that does a drum side stick, and then Pig plays plays again, you know. The people in uh, New York said, it's a little empty in the middle, isn't it, Billy? He said, it's a hit. Put it out. 
And the engineer in Memphis told me, he said, I about wrecked my car when that thing stopped in the middle and pig started again. He said, that was so cool. Oh, well, uh, you had uh, Herschel Wigginton's group, the Nashville edition, you know, that was on the Hee Haw. It was Herschel and Joe Babcock. Herschel Wigginton was a bass singer and Joe and uh, Dolores Edgen and Wendy Such. And then uh, the were well, the background singers. Pig was on piano. Tommy Alsop was playing bass guitar. That's Tic Tac bass. Henry Strzelecki is on bass. Uh, Jerry Kerrigan's a drummer. Two acoustic guitar players, and I'd have to go look to see because those and Billy Sanford's on electric, Pete Drake's on steel. And then we overdubbed strings. And uh, Billy had a pecking order on, on his lead player, lead, electric lead. If Jerry Kennedy was here and Billy Sanford walked in, he'd see Kennedy, he'd go get his acoustic guitar because he knew this is what he was going to play without a word being said. If Sanford walked in and see Kennedy, he'd go get his electric because he'd be the lead player. Well, if Pete Wade walked in and saw neither Kennedy or Sanford, he'd go get his electric. You see, they knew the pecking order. And uh, I never heard them discuss it at all. Those guitar players knew you know, what they were hired to do. And uh, if a certain guy was there, he was going to be the lead player. I heard uh, Bill Russell, a great basketball player, say one time, he said, if you want to watch a great basketball player, watch what he does when he doesn't have the ball. That's what determines a great player, the stuff he does when he's not the main guy with the ball. And, and the same is true with session players. That song was not a guitar song. It was uh, piano, steel, you know. Billy Sanford's playing lead on it. Listen, next time you hear it, listen to the bridge. There's a nice little tasty lick in the bridge. But Sanford would hunt around to, to what his role was and fill it or come up with something that would add. If you turn this track off or turn this mic off, uh, where'd the record go? But he was not the main guy, you know. And that's what a great session player is. He, he, he figures out what his role is on that, that song, that day, that cut, and does it, you know. And, and all of them at work where Billy would do that. I used to give some little songwriter start hanging around new to town, you know. So I could tell, I'd hear some of their stuff, and so they might have some talent, and I was going to try to give them some good advice and show them something that, that might help them, you know. A lot of times they'd be here on a two o'clock and we wouldn't be anything behind us. And I said, I'm going to play you two cuts here and see if you can tell the difference. And I'd go get the behind closed door master and play the whole thing through once as we recorded it, then play it through the second time. And there was two lines changed in the last verse. And I'd watch them, see if they picked up on that. I said, what you heard was a credited hit writing songwriter who took some constructive criticism from somebody that he trusted and respected, Billy Sherrill, because Billy said the last verse needs to be stronger. The, the original lyric almost led you to believe they went behind closed doors and held hands. You know, it was a little milder. And they and for the life of me, now I can't remember what two lines they changed. I, I said, and Kenny O'Dell went to school on what Billy asked him to do. And he made a great song, A Monster, because it, it, it made that last verse stronger. How long did the session take to cut the basic track? We, we cut about three. We'd cut three songs and, and sometimes four. Mostly, we need to do three or four in, in, in three hours. You know, we'd do three sessions, have an album, the basic tracks, and we, we might do overdub. We'd, we'd use a lot of live vocals. And, uh, and we'd, like on that, we overdubbed strings, mixed her down. <laughs> the, the reverb sound is just amazingly great. And it seems like a huge part of Charlie Rich's vocal sound. On well, we had these good EMT chambers and like uh, two, two things about the reverb on that. And if we talk about the most beautiful girl, there's a, a little sideline on that too, which was another cut that we did later that when it was in that album. I used EMT and, and we'd put the, uh, a slap back behind the EMT. And I'd, I'd have the straight EMT coming back and. Uh, and then going through a tape machine to delay in, you could use more or less of that. You know, you fool with that to get a good, warm, full vocal sound. And like on drums, on that, he was, Kerrigan was doing, the, he was playing Old Red. He had a red snare drum I called Old Red, and he's playing Old Red on Behind Closed Doors, and I remember he played, the, he had a maple one. I never named it. It was a, a maple snare, a little deeper, on Beautiful Girl. I loved Old Red. I, I, 
later I said, you sold that drum. I'd like to have bought it just to have it. <laughs> but he, uh, on a song where uh, he was playing a side stick or the drummer's playing, you know what I'm talking about, a side stick where they lay it over and hit the rim. A lot of guys want to make that real narrow and skinny and go crack. I tried to make the side stick go talk. If, if you have a whole verse of crack, crack, that gets old. The talk lays better against when he goes to the snare and to the vocal, and it's, it's not, it's more pleasing. And I'd also use a, a live, we had a live room chamber. The, on the, the one I used on that was down the basement. And uh, I'd use that on cuts where we had the old side stick going generally in the verses. And then they'd kick it up in the, in the bridges or vert courses, and he'd, he'd go over to the snare. But Kerrigan was a good drummer. He listened to the singer. Was he a Muscle Shoals guy? He was a, him. The original Muscle Shoals rhythm section was Kerrigan and David Briggs and Norbert Putnam and Jimmy Johnson in uh, Spain. And uh, the three that came up here, uh, Briggs and Kerrigan and uh, Putnam, you know, and they, they really made the, all of them made their mark up here. But Kerrigan was a great drummer. He uh, Good drummers listen to the singer. Worked with uh, Buddy Harmon, worked with Larry London. And recently, I've worked with uh, George Vaselli, who's Bob Dylan's drummer. Haggard, I was doing Haggard, and Haggard worked some shows with Dylan and fell in love with him. So we'd, when we could, we'd get Vaselli out there. He's a New Orleans guy, but he uh, is a, a drummer that plays with feeling, but listens to the singer. And uh, that, if, you know, if you just get in there and play, that's not what a, a drummer on a session needs to do. He needs to listen to the song and the singer and, and figure out what to do. And those great session drummers do that. Billy Sheridan there would use a player. Some of them wanted double scale. Now, there was one player always in the room that got double scale. That was whoever the leader was. Whoever was the designated leader of the group, he got double scale because he had some responsibilities the others didn't have. But Cheryl said, why should I pay? And sometimes he'd use some of those double scale guys if the artist pushed him to use them. You know, I want this guitar player or this guy or whatever. But he said, why should I pay a guy double when Pig Robbins is sitting over paying the best piano you can get for scale? You know, I think right. <laughs> you know, so he wouldn't. <laughs> if, unless the artist just wanted, wanted to and he was trying to appease the artist. You know. I hate to dwell on the Pig Robbins stuff, but this well, is he's a worth testament. Known. He's a good friend and a great player. That whole album is a testament to just how great a player he he is. Oh, he's he's got so much taste and uh Pig Robbins is an amazing individual. He's blind. Most people some people don't know that, but he's blind from that in his youth. He was blinded in his youth, it was an accident. But he went to the school of the blind and from he came out of the school of the blind with a job. He's earned his way the whole time. I, I admire that about Pig Robbins. He was work when he came out of the school for the blind. He worked developing film in a lab because they didn't work in the dark. Then he started playing. He could play piano. He started playing gigs around and uh, started recording. His first big hit, number one, he played on was uh, White Lightning. He told me that. I just love working with that guy, and we're good friends. We go to eat catfish every once in a while. He lives about a mile and a half from me, and just a super guy. One time, if you want Pig Robin stories, we had 39 pieces out here. I mean, wall to wall, was doing O.C. Smith, big orchestra, strings, horns, background singers, percussion, four guitars, and uh, drums, and bass, and two keyboards. And Briggs was playing the, the, the acoustic piano, and Pig was playing either electric or, or, and so we did an old song that Dorsey Burnett had a hit on back in the 60s called The Tall Oak Tree was a tall oak tree and it got uh, it's a great arranger hb barnum was the ranger conductor and we started working that up and they put pig on hammond b3 organ and if anything will hang over on a break uh would be an organ well pigs on hammond and they run through it the first time they got six conducted breaks and they stopped pig hung over on every one of them and jerry fuller's the producer he says, uh, Brent, we need to put some over there and poke Pig on them cutoffs. I said, if Pig needs help, he'll ask for it. We did six takes, six breaks. Pig's never missed another break. Right on it. 
He said, that's amazing. And the guy's watching, the conductor missed him. But here, here's this blind guy. And I said, let me tell you, Jerry, he was paying attention the first time they went through. That's how, how, how much a blind person, especially a pig, had to pay attention. He sensed the timing. And so he wasn't going to vary, vary from that. And he was right on on every take, you know. He, he was amazing. And uh, one time he said the lights went out of the studio. <laughs> and uh, it was obvious to Pig what had happened from the convert, you know, what people were saying. And Pig got up and said, ha, ha, ha. I'm the only one here who knows there's three chairs, two mic stands, and a mic boom between me <laughs> and, the, and the door and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Charlie Rich... Uh, I asked Pig one time, I said, uh, what's it like playing? He said, I was nervous. I said, he's a heck of a piano player. There he is right at my shoulder. You know, when when we started recording him right there by the piano. Earlier, I alluded to the fact Charlie had the sex appeal. It was unreal, the, the appeal he had to the ladies. And we did a session. We had two sessions one day, a 10 and a 2. The sessions used to be, and uh, still are, I guess, there was four session possibilities during the day a 10 o'clock to 1, a, a 2 to 5, a 6 to 9, and a uh, 10 to 1, you know, in the morning. And uh, we had a, two, a 10 and a 2. And Daryl Royal, the Texas football coach, came. He was a Charlie Rich fan. So I had him a stool sitting right over the console. And then I had him one out in the bass and drums and piano right there where he could see Charlie, you know. And so he'd, he'd sit in here for a while, then he'd go out there. And he was just having a good time. He stayed for both sessions. And he invited Charlie and Billy to a Texas football game, be on the sidelines. And Cheryl showed me this. He said, we walked out. It was before the game, and we walked out there. And both bands were on the field and the cheerleaders and all that. And he said, Charlie Rich stepped out on that field. And every woman in both of them bands and the cheerleaders, they started running out of mob us. He said, I was scared. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I mean, they was going to mob Charlie Rich. Whatever he had, you couldn't buy a bottle or sell, man. He had it. He could and, sing so well. Oh, yeah. He had his own style, man. You, when you heard him, you knew who he was. And I, I love recording him, you know. Some of the songs that weren't hits on Behind Closed Door albums, I mean, he sounded like Bing Crosby type crooner. Oh, yeah. He, Charlie was a, a musical guy, it was, you know. And, and he and Cheryl had gone back to Sam Phillips' days. In fact, Cheryl recorded the Sitting and Thinking hit. That was cut in Nashville, not in Memphis. Sam Phillips built the studio here. And Cheryl was an engineer for Sam Phillips down at, on the 7th Avenue. They built it down on 7th Avenue. It later became Monument. Uh, Sam sold it to Fred Foster, and that's where the first record they cut in there, I think, was Pretty Woman. Working with Charlie was, you know, you, you, had, you had to be on your toes because, as I said, we was cutting live, everybody all there in a, in a group. But it worked. We would, we did an album with Andy Williams and he's right down in there by the piano. As I said, it, Billy did everybody there after we recorded uh, Behind Closed Doors. <laughs> he said, this is too good to not do with everybody. And uh, so that was the hand I was dealt and I had to play it. But uh, I'm, I'm in here getting ready to record and this guy comes in the control room, introduces himself. His name's Dick Glasser. And I knew who he was. He said, I've been producing Andy in Hollywood and I'm here for no other reason. I'm not here to do anything other than ask you a question. I said, I might know the answer. He said, how did you get the cymbal sound on the most beautiful girls? <laughs> but Charlie Rich. The console area was raised up about four inches. They had built it up. And then they built a wall where that rose up there to keep people off your back so you could go around either side of it. But they couldn't just get, get over your back and the producer's back. I got him a stool. I said, sit right there, and I'll uh, I'll show you. I said, the first time they go through, I'll be ready to record. I'll get my mix up, and I'll take my hands off the controls and show you. Well, I can see a doubting Thomas a little bit in his eyes back there. I'm kind of watching out from eyes. And they and we're doing one of those pretty ballads that Tammy recorded, that Bit of Cheryl then wrote. And it was more than a three chord country song. So when you're cutting live and you have leaky, leaky just where the sound of one thing leaks over in another mic. I won't get into big technical thing, but if they're not together, that leakage uh, makes it sound even worse, okay? But when they get together, it adds. Oh, it's good. And so they start, and uh, 
first time through, they're still feeling their way, you know, with this unusual, you know, it's more chord changes than, as I said, a three chord song. Second time through, I can hear them getting tighter. And then the third time through, I can hear them really getting, boy, about halfway through, they locked in and they come dancing out of the speakers. And a big grin came on the guy's face. I'm watching him out of Carmel. He said, it was the leakage into the vocal mic, wasn't it? And I said, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I'd have never got it. I worked six hours in an L.A. studio and never got it. Now, another interesting little sidelight on that record, the next time you listen to it, two little things. Uh, I call it the old Batman lick. The, the acoustic guitars and, and, the, and the rhythm guys did it. Uh, hey, dum, dum, dum. Yeah, that, that lick there. And Bill McElhinney did the strings, and he really went to town on that. You know, and the strings did that, dun, dun, and that that really set that off. That was that was a neat flavor in that record. In the bridge, listen to the steel. No, everywhere else, this Pete Drake could do these great old licks. You know, that's what I loved about Pete. He he, he would play these great licks that just fit. Sometimes like horn licks, even. Oh yeah, it was Pete Drake was a bit of Cheryl's horn. Like on listen to. Uh, Stand by your man and Pete Drake's bit of Cheryl's horn section. What he played in the bridges on that. Anyway, Pete was playing just some pedal licks, you know. But then he, on a break, he does this high slide. Well, when we re the first time he did it, you know, we was running it down. So I, I rigged up a chamber just on Pete that I could turn on just for that lick and, and like on the stereo. He's over here with a lot of reverb on him. And then I've got the whole, a whole chamber over here that's nothing but that big slide. And boy, it, it made it zing. So next time you hear behind clothes, I met a most beautiful girl, listen for that high slide that Pete did on his steel. Pete, Pete was a good player. You know, he was not the greatest technical steel player, but he listened to the song and he played uh, real commercial. You know, he, he played you a lick that meant something. Some, like listen to what Pete played on the uh, the Grand Tour with George Jones. He, he he's probably got goosebumps on his arm singing to what George is playing to what George is singing. You know, because George is not far from him out there when, when we recorded that. There's an interaction between the players when they're hearing each other live and looking at each other in the eye. I call it a together dynamic that you can't get any other way but that way. You, you can make a, a, a really good sounding record with earphones and everybody isolated in their own little room or overdubbed after the fact, you know, building a record that way. And they, it's going to sound good. But that little spark, I call it the together dynamic. For instance, if you recorded uh, the old big bands, you know, with the horn bands, like Glenn Miller and something, if you recorded all of that separate, the, the dynamics they'd play in with... Uh, play together and then then you did a multi-track recording of the same thing and made each section play separate or you, each home player you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Dog, you you could instantly hear the difference when you played the two like you heard the one where there's all live because they're, they're feeling it off each other when you say d dynamics I know you didn't mean it this way, but maybe this is a Billy Sherrill thing, but the dynamics on that record are amazing. Well, now, that's great. another thing. I'm glad you asked me that question. Everybody thought Billy Sherrill's, and a lot of producers tried to copy Billy Sherrill, the dynamic things he'd do. But I took, I took, after working with him 13 years or more, actually I did some stuff for him after Columbia closed, but they thought that was what he was going for, was the dynamics. Well, the dynamics... Like Tammy had this great way to sing verses soft, so he'd make the band play soft. And boy, when she kicked it in, into the bridge and generally the melody went up, the band didn't kick it, swat it. And the dynamics came from that. He was trying to make the voice happen, the singer and the song happen, and he made the band play in a way to make that happen, not necessarily for the dynamics. That was just a, a side end thing. They, they nailed it, you know. You can't believe how loud they'd play. And people would come in here, other producers, and say, I want to record just like you record Charlie Rich and Tammy Wynette. And I said, come here. So you, 
Your singer's gonna stand right there. Now the drums are just a piano width away. Okay. They were not in a room. They're just open over there. And your background's gonna be here. Well, it'd be leaky, just said. That's right. They didn't have the you know what's to record that way, but Billy Sherrill did. He was he was going for feeling. I call some of the way people record now defensively. We record it offensively. We were going for it. Defensively, they want to record so they can change it if they want to. Well, sometimes we'd change things. I'd have to figure out, you know, I'd get leakage. I, I became a, had all kind of little tricks. If I had leakage on a track that I couldn't turn off because the voice, you know, was leaking oil and everything. Wasn't there a, a phantom vocal and the... Yeah, there is on behind closed doors if you listen real close. But I hit it so good that it's hard for me to even hear it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, earlier we were talking about the two lines they changed. I was a Charlie Rich fan, and I was I was excited about getting the recording whenever I came to work at Columbia and started working with Billy. Man, so, you know, Charlie's going to record, and they pitched him to Billy. You know, and the, he liked those songs. You know, in fact, after Behind Closed Doors was a big hit in the alley right behind the studio where we are. Tell them, tell them where we are. We're in Columbia B Studio, yeah. which is the Quonset Hut where Music Road started. And uh, anyway, I ran into Kenny after Behind Closed Doors was like a big hit. And I said, what you doing with all that money, Kenny? He said, I'm paying for nine years of poverty. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you struggle. Behind Closed Doors sold a million and a half singles. The Beautiful Girl sold five million, and the album sold 10 million eventually. It was a good good <laughs> album for Charlie Rich and Billy Sherrill. I was working for wages. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I was here for, you know?